So we all know what state-run media looks like. It looks like North Korea's central news agency, with recent headlines such as Respected Comrade Kim Jong-un receives floral basket from Lao President. Respected Comrade Kim Jong-un receives floral basket from Palestinian President. Or Respected Comrade Kim Jong-un says flowers nice, but when one of these guys going to commit? We've all learned to hate the idea of state-run media, but in his open letter to open-minded progressives, Curtis Yarvin asks a good question. What about a media-run state? What would that look like? Well, according to Yarvin, it looks like what we have right now. I know it's hard to believe that our society is run by people like this guy, but just go with me for a second. Yarvin says that our media-run state functions in a similar way to how a church-run state does. As a sort of secularist ecclesiocracy, the media defines orthodoxy, calls upon the state to punish heresy, and can install and remove political figures. In his book The Stakes, Michael Anton talks about three elements of the regime's propaganda operation. The narrative, the megaphone, and the muzzle. First, the narrative. Here's Anton. The narrative is the meta-story, the message that elites want every American to accept unquestioningly. We organize our lives around narratives, and if you control the narrative, you control how people think about the past, present, and future. You control people's private thoughts and feelings. People didn't take an experimental injection because they'd thought through the arguments. They took it because they saw themselves as characters in a narrative, and they wanted to be one of the good guys. After all, isn't an experimental injection how Captain America got his powers? Spoiler, those aren't muscles, those are blood clots. But the same goes for people who didn't take it. They believed a different narrative. This is why the regime is so intent on keeping narrative control. So what is our regime's narrative. Here's Anton again. The core message of the meta-narrative is that America is fundamentally and inherently racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, Islamophobic, transphobic, and so on. For Christians, the first sin was Adam eating the fruit. For these people, the first sin was not giving the fruit a cabinet position. The flaws and sins of America derive directly from those of its founding stock, who were natural predators, inherently racist, and malevolent. They never decline a chance to harm people of color unless prevented by force. So if your ancestors have been here more than a couple hundred years, you're basically racist Godzilla. Anton's next category is the megaphone. Its role is to disseminate doctrines that the elite has already adopted. They do this through what they call reporting. In support of the narrative that deplorables are both in power and predatorially racist, the media scours the nation in search of ordinary crime blotter stories that it can blow up into national panics. Hence, the Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, and Freddie Gray cases were covered with the zeal the press used to reserve for events the magnitude of Pearl Harbor. And it must be noted, in every instance, they got the story wrong. For the media's core role is not to report the news, but to push the narrative. It's not about the details, it's about the vibe. A campfire story doesn't have to be true to keep the kids up at night, and they'll never tell you about the real monsters. <laughs> they also do this through so-called fact-checking. They all strike the same pose. We're just umpires calling balls and strikes. Their real purpose is to push the narrative and undermine, distort, or attack any corrections, reputations, or counterclaims. Conservatives complain endlessly about all this, but get nowhere. They stack examples of media bias like cordwood. Indeed, whole think tanks have for decades been doing exactly this, and the left never gives a millimeter. Why would they? They've made themselves the sole arbiter of truth. This is why it's misguided to fight back by saying, I know, we'll just fact check them. But it doesn't work for us the way it works for them. They're in charge, and they think your little fact checks are just adorable. Then there's the muzzle. A big part of the muzzle is controlling what conversations we won't be having. Of course, they do this by overwhelming us with certain things. Trump's trials, the Kamala Nam on. But another way they do this is by painting certain issues as low class. Hunter Biden's laptop, 2020 election meddling, resistance to the shot, caring about the border. Those are things that only Trump loyalists or ultra MAGA people care about. They'll try to make you ashamed to be associated with those dirty people. They'll ruin Rudy Giuliani's life, yes, because they want to, but also because it makes lots of people not want to associate with him. If you don't want to be that kind of right winger, there's always a path out. Agree with us on these issues. You can still argue for a balanced budget. You can still complain about high taxes, but you can never go there. Pastor Doug Wilson has called this cool shaming. And if you do what the left wants, you can be as cool as these guys. Overall, they win by distraction. It's like you're in the middle of a battle and the opposing army challenges you to a game of marbles. So you send all your troops to the marble game. Then the other guys make sure to cheat at the marbles so that you'll call them out and feel like you've won. They're gaining ground while we're quibbling over a cat's eye. It's not enough just to call this bias. It's not that they like one side more than the other. It's that they're running the show. That means that this won't change through complaint. Complaining. It changes through winning. And to win, we have to know who the enemy is. <laughs>